Now, uh, you've probably seen in the paper that um, a certain local MP has talked about people joining the Labour Party uh, and turning it into a fan club. I, I, I don't agree with that. I think that's a mistake. I think people, yes, are fans of Jeremy Corbyn, but the reason people are fans of Jeremy Corbyn is because of his policy agenda. His policy to make the economy work for ordinary people. His policy to create secure jobs. His policy to build council houses and to give working class kids a chance to get a home of their own again. His policy to end the commodification of education, to get rid of tuition fees. Why should we penalise people for having the temerity to get an education? We need an educated society, don't we? When you go to the hospital, you want an educated doctor, don't you? When you have ride on your motorcycle or your car, you want to make sure that it's, or you want to be assured that it's built by engineers who are properly educated and properly trained so we all benefit from education. And the other thing, which is so important, that Jeremy Corbyn has made very clear, and one of the things that I regret most of all from the 13 years that Labour were in government, and was the fact that we didn't repeal the anti-trade union legislation, which has led to an explosion of low-paying, insecure employment in this country. We've got to bring that to an end. People are crying out for a different approach. Jeremy Corbyn offers that different approach. So please give a big warm welcome to the next Prime Minister. Good afternoon, Derby. Thank you very much, every one of you, for coming here today. It's great to be here. This is the third time I've been in Derby in the past year. Last year we had that amazing rally at the Roundhouse that I was here supporting the local election campaigns for the Police and Crime Commissioner and all the other campaigns that were undertaking. A year ago, just over, we lost a general election. There was no worse result in that general election than Chris Williamson not being elected in Derby that day. Because he was an absolutely brilliant Member of Parliament, a man of vision, a man of ideas, a man of inclusive politics, and he's now working very hard to put all those same ideals and same aspirations into effect. And I look forward to working very closely with Chris in many, many ways in the future, I hope, as another Member of Parliament. Chris, thank you for everything that you do and what you said here today. Because what our campaign is doing is bringing a lot of people together in lots of ways. Last year, the general election result was a disaster for many people in this country. We all know that. We all know that there are reasons that we lost that election. There were many good points in our election manifesto. I don't go away from that. There were good points in it. But the fundamental problem was that we hadn't dealt with the issue of the banking crisis of 2008-9, we'd allowed somehow or other a media campaign and Tory propaganda to say the banking crisis was caused by alleged labour overspending. I simply say this, it wasn't nurses, teaching assistants, doctors, street cleaners or anyone else working in the public centre sector that crashed the banks in 2008-9. It was the lack of regulation and the greed of the banking community that did it in the first place. And sadly, the solution to that problem was seen to be, well, this is an opportunity to make massive cuts in public expenditure, having put £300 billion into the banking system, to ensure that the poorest and most vulnerable in our society paid the price for it. So, for the past six years, what have we had? A massive cut in local authority expenditure. Derbyshire alone losing £100 million over that period and set to lose more. Every major city in this country losing large amounts of money. But it's not an even sacrifice that's being made. You could take a map of England, you could put a red colour over each area which is below the national average of income, that has the higher levels of demand for housing, 
that has greater levels of child poverty, that has worse health records. You could cover all those areas with red. Then you could take another map, overlay it with a different colour. Shall we say blue? For all those areas that have received the biggest cut in central government expenditure. And you know what? The blue would obliterate the red. Because what they've done is selected areas of high need, of relatively high spending because of that high need, and made them pay the price. And how's that price paid? That price is paid with longer housing waiting lists. It's paid by homeless people sleeping on the streets because there's nowhere for them to go. It's paid by those going through a mental health crisis, not getting the help and support they need. It's paid by all the vulnerable people in this country. And they then accompany all this with the idea that somehow or other, it's all about greed. Well, yes, it is all about greed. When we're told that the way forward is to reduce levels of corporate taxation, cut taxation at the top, cut public expenditure for the rest of us, and then be happy that we live in a more and more unequal society. Well, we've had 40 years of being told that inequality is good for us. Reagan said that in the USA when he started with what was then called Proposition 13 in California. We then had Thatcher here doing the same. We had all those years of a Tory government doing the same. And we now have another Tory government doing exactly the same. I simply say this. I want the next generation to be able to benefit from all the technological advances made by this generation and past generations. I want the next generation to be even better educated than this one. I want the next generation to have those opportunities for school, college, university, apprenticeships, training, and all the other things that we can do. I want the next generation to live in a safer world than we do. I want the next generation to live on a sustainable planet where we all make efforts to bring about that degree of sustainability. But you're not going to achieve that, that legacy for the next generation of a better quality of life if we destroy the public services we've got and educate people in the idea that somehow or other inequality and greed is good for us. Well, it isn't. And what we're doing is offering something very, very different in politics now. As I said, a year ago we lost that election. We lost it in part because of the way we were treated during that campaign and beforehand, but also in part because we were still pledged to making some culture, still pledged to a public sector wage freeze, which is in effect a cut in the list. We lost the election because we weren't offering something significantly different. A year ago, in Parliament, the Labour Party MPs were being told we had to abstain on the welfare reform bill because we had to accept the results of the general election, which clearly indicated everybody wanted welfare cuts around the whole country. I voted against that welfare reform bill. And after the results of the leadership election, when we, all of us, we won that election campaign, I asked John McDonnell to take on the job as Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer and come up immediately with a different economic story, a different economic proposal. And John coined it in a very apt sentence when he simply said this, austerity, austerity is a political choice, not an economic necessity. And you know what? A year later, you can hardly find anybody who doesn't now agree with John McDonnell. Who says politics hasn't changed? And we opposed the welfare reform bill and opposed the cuts that are taking place in benefits. And you know what? The Tories have had some defeats on this. They were defeated when they tried to cut working tax credits. And I'm proud and grateful to every Labour MP and every Labour peer and others who voted to make sure that cut was defeated. As a result, three million families, 
3 million families across Britain are a £1,000 better off this year than they would have been if the Tories had had their way. And during the budget, when George Osborne, miraculously in the middle of a budget speech, suddenly launched off into a policy, I was looking at him and I thought, what on earth is this man on? And what an thing unfolded in front of me. And he then comes out with this absolute corker that uh, having already announced a reduction in corporate taxation and various forms of uh, changes in inheritance tax and other things, all of which benefited the better off in our society, he suddenly announced that uh, four billion was going to be taken from the personal independence payments of those with disabilities. Well, I simply ask you this question. We've fought for a very long time for decent opportunities, respect and opportunities for independent living for those with disabilities. We as a community support those with disabilities, not in a charitable or patronising way, but to give them the same rights to contribute, to work, to think, to be creative in our society as everybody else. It's about a decent and respectful society. And an awful lot of people felt exactly the same. And I met those who are in receipt of personal independence payments the following days in my own constituency and many others. They were frightened, they were fearful, they did not know what was going to happen. And you know what? A few days later, Ian Duncan Smith resigned. The government was forced to retreat. The personal independence payments were an inhuman attack on those people who should be supported, recognised and valued in our society. And in that same budget speech, a few moments later, George Osborne, I'm not sure what he's doing at the moment, by the way, but uh, George Osborne then headed off into education policy and calmly announced that uh, every school had to become an academy or a free school, every single one in the whole country. Well, there's a few, um, there's a few price tags that come with free schools and academies. The first one is it breaks up the principle of national pay agreements for the teaching and other professions. It takes away the role of local authorities and their democratic role in holding schools to account and being held to account themselves for the education service that they offer. But it also takes away the whole opportunity of what I call the family of education. When a good local authority, good local education authority, brings together a family of schools, all schools, special schools, primary schools, secondary schools, all those, and is able, through its collective approach, to offer the add-ons, the good music, the good art, the good culture, the outdoor activities, the sports facilities, bringing young people together in a spirit of cooperation and understanding between each other's schools, cooperation and understanding in a common endeavor to improve themselves, their learning, their ideas, their knowledge and their imagination. Instead, it's to be replaced with a competition between every school, many of them privately owned, the buildings being threatened with being sold off and so many other things. We defeated them on that again because of popular outrage and what they were doing. And I thank all the teaching unions for their campaign on that. So it's not as if there hasn't been a lot of success over the past year. And when we hold these campaign events around the country during this year of a leadership election, we're doing a lot of them. This is the 21st event we've done since our campaign started. And we're going to every major town and city all over Britain in these rallies and campaigns. Lincoln. Yes, Lincoln. OK, thanks. I got the message. Is that the Lincolnshire poacher that's arrived? <laughs> we'll get everywhere we can. I promise you that. Whether, where a train goes, we can go, all right? Um, I'm coming to trains. Don't worry. I, re I really am coming to trains. And what these rallies do is bring people together. Bring people together in all the campaigns and show that, yes, we might have different campaigning interests that we're, pr we're pursuing, but fundamentally, we're pursuing the same objectives. And so when I arrived here today, 
I've been given a number of leaflets and booklets, as I often am, and I really appreciate that. The first one is from Unison members working in the schools. <laughs> Chris has made the point on that. I tell you this, I absolutely value the role of the entire team in a school, including the teaching assistants and the support staff. I come from a background of being a full-time organiser in the National Union of Public Employees, organising all of those members of the union. It's good catering workers and all the other grades. And that surely is a message and a lesson that we can give to all our youngsters. And then I was also given a wonderful leaflet from the Derbyshire Waspy Group. Thank you very much for that. And what they've suggested is that today is Transport Tuesday. We should make tomorrow Waspy Wednesday. So thanks for, the, thanks for that leaflet. Thanks for the campaign that you're doing. Because, once again, it's women who are being asked to pay the price. Women who are being told they're going to be worse off when they retire later. Women who are not given any transitional opportunities throughout that. I'm with the WASPI campaign. Well done on being here today and what you've said. And then I was given a leaflet saying, keep the guard on the train, keep the train safe from our friends in the RMT and the other rail unions as well who are supporting this. This morning we started early. We were at London Bridge Station. And I have to say, some of the commuters that came off the Brighton line, um, I don't blame them for being upset and angry because if you've stood for an hour on a train, paid through the nose for the ticket, and the, um, the Metro and the Evening Standard are telling you that all your problems, your high fare, your overcrowding, your delayed train, your cancelled train, and all the other things, are somehow or other the fault of the RMT, ASLEF and TSSA, and you come out of the station and you see RMT, ASLEF and TSSA banners, you think, yeah, they're the people that caused all my trouble. So let's go and have it out with them. Well, a few people turned up and they said, well, they were quite angry. I don't blame them for being angry. So what then happened was a very interesting conversation and discussion. And we were able to point out that Southern Rail has made increased profits over the past half year, that its directors have increased their pay over the past year, that dividend payments have increased over the past year, that hundreds of trains have been cancelled over the last few months and they're trying to reduce the number of staff so you have driver-only trains on a very busy, very crowded route. Is it not the responsibility of those that work on the trains to point out to the public what they see as, quite rightly, the dangers of all this, hence the campaign they're mounting? Our view is the government should intervene on this they should intervene where the franchises are clearly not being adhered to. And at the end of every franchise, let's bring it back into public ownership and have a publicly owned rail system. So keeping guards on trains is only part of it. And so in this campaign, we're putting forward 10 positive policy areas and policy points of how we could do things better and differently in the future. This is not the last word in a manifesto. Last year, we put out a lot of policy ideas for consultation. And you know what? Thousands and thousands of people have replied. Some have agreed with them, some have disagreed with them, some have put up alternative ideas, some have put up completely different ideas. Surely, that is what democracy is about. That is what you get when you have a party membership of well over half a million people engaged and active in politics. And so let's look at, I won't go through all of them, but let's look at some of them. Deal with issues of rights at work and employment. There is something strange about modern Britain that we're in breach of international labour organisation conventions on employment law in Britain. I want us to have a Labour government that says, the starting point, we will adhere to all ILO conventions. We would demand it of every other country in the world. Why don't we carry it out ourselves? And then look at the levels of job insecurity. 18 countries in Europe have outlawed the whole idea of zero hours contracts. Let's do the same here. That level of insecurity in work has to be dealt with. It is very difficult 
to plan anything in your life if you don't know when you're going to work, how much you're going to be paid for it, and what you're going to get next week, the week after, the week after that. You're hanging on, waiting for your mobile to ring to say, please come to work. You get halfway there, and they ring you back and say, sorry, we don't really need you after all today. So you've lost money hanging around, you've lost money on travelling, and you haven't got any pay as a result of it. And so, when we campaign on these issues, things do begin to change. Last year and this year in the USA, the very biggest unions there campaigned for a $15 an hour minimum wage. They campaigned both politically as well as industrially. Campaigned on a $15 an hour minimum for fast food workers in McDonald's and all the other big chains. And do you know what? They've won it in a very large number of states. They forced the Democratic Party to support that in their um, convention statement. And last weekend, they had a low-paid workers conference in Richmond, Virginia, and they asked me to send a message of solidarity to them. And I was proud to do it and proud to say we're on the same page, the same place, the same side. We want a decent £10 an hour living wage in this country. We want an end to the poverty paying conditions in the fast food industry where so many huge profits are being made. But then you look at other aspects of employment practices in Britain. Chris and I have a great friend, I'm sure many of you do also have a great friend, Dennis Skinner, MP for Bolsover. And Dennis is a great supporter of this campaign. And Dennis did a very brilliant, very short intervention in Parliament. His most brilliant ones are the very short ones. You know, the one that begins with D and ends in Y. Um, he intervened on a speech John McDonnell was making and said, he worked in Shirebrook Colliery. When he worked there, it was a mine. When he worked there, they were all in the union. When he worked there, they all had recognised paying conditions. When he worked there, they all had rights of representation, rights to health and safety. They had a welfare system. They had a welfare community. There was a strong sense of unity in the mining community. Unity because people need to be very strongly in support of each other in a dangerous place like a pit, but also because that was the whole spirit of the place and the community. The Tories and Thatcher couldn't stand that sense of unity and community. That's why they went after the mining industry in the 1980s. That's why they destroyed the coal mining industry in this country. And Shirebrook. Shirebrook is a warehouse run by Sport Direct. Shirebrook is a warehouse run by Sport Direct that even an all-party select committee in Parliament found to be grossly wanting in health, in safety, in conditions of work, and indeed not even paying the minimum wage to the people that work there. And the ambulance and the fire tender frequently called there because of dangers in that place of work. Doesn't that say something about modern deregulated Britain? That an efficient place of work, working together with full rights of work, was efficient and was well managed and is replaced by this kind of spiff culture that goes on there. Well, I tell you this, our Workplace 2020 is about changing that, is about getting rid of the concept of zero-hours contracts and insecurity at work, is about giving rights of representation, rights of trade union membership, and rights to live in a decent society, but also rights to work in a decent and safe working environment. This government cuts health and safety. We will invest in health and safety to protect all workers on building sites and elsewhere in this country. But it's also about the kind of economy that we want and the productive work that we want. Derby is famous as a manufacturing in the industrial centre. So much has been produced and is produced here. You've got iconic names here. And I'm so pleased that so much work done by Chris and others to protect the train manufacturing facility in Derby is paid off with those new orders for construction of trains here in Derby. This is a place that built so much of our railway system and will continue to do so. Likewise, Rolls-Royce, the major employer, and what it does in, in Derby and so many others. But we also need to recognise that as a country we've got to harness the skills that everybody has. That means investment in improving infrastructure all over the country. Why is it 
the northeast particularly is so starved of capital investment compared to what goes in the south? Why is it it's taken so long to force the government to recognise the needs to electrify the Midland Main Line? Why is it it's taken so long to get investment spread across the whole country? So our proposal is a £500 billion national investment bank that will invest in the infrastructure we need, will invest in broadband technology, but will also invest in new products and product development. So instead of us in this country discovering, inventing and creating new ideas and new products, which are never manufactured here but sent somewhere else to be manufactured, instead we'll have a public stake in it and it's by that investment strategy. And for those that are understandably concerned about future of defence spending, and in particular my views on nuclear weapons and Trident, I say this, I understand the concern, I am very opposed to But I want to make sure there is a proper defence diversification strategy with public investment going in to ensure that we, it's not a way of cutting jobs, it's a way of ensuring that those skills are used fully in manufacturing industry in all areas in the future. And I'm very, very clear and very determined about that. So it's about an expanding economy to create decent, good quality jobs for all. But you do that by also looking at our education service and our health service and the inequalities that go with it in society. Too many of our children start life with a big handicap. They can't get proper nursery or preschool facilities. Either their parents can't afford it, they're not eligible for it, or they only get a few hours a week. Those preschool years are so important for children, growing up together, understanding each other, beginning to understand social interactions and all the human skills they need to develop. Let's make sure place every a decent start. And then later on, when youngsters leave school and go to college or go to university or want to get an apprenticeship, a number of things happen. One is, some do very well, get to university, get a good degree, and well done them and good luck to them. But why do we then saddle them with a debt of 50 or 60,000 pounds at the end of it? As Chris said, what we've done is turn education into a commodity. Can't we instead say education is a right for all of us that we really want. And also ensure that um, apprenticeships, some apprenticeships are absolutely brilliant and really good. The best companies do really good apprenticeships, really good training and good. A pittance of a rate, a minimum wage, the youth minimum rate, and say there is a minimum rate for everybody. Been you eat just as much as when you're 25 or 35. Or in my experience, people of eight, young people of 18 eat a great deal more than older people. So it is a question of ensuring that apprenticeships are good, are good quality and are training, and uh, good training and good qualifications at the end of it, but also not necessarily age limited. I've been to some colleges which are taking much older apprenticeships that where people want to retrain. Surely all of that is good. Let's change the attitude towards education and ensure that, as Chris pointed out, when somebody is well educated and well qualified, it's good for them, of course, but it's also good for all of us. Good for all of us when people are well qualified and able to contribute to society. So inequality starts with discrimination in education. Discrimination on the basis of areas and income. Let's give those decent, good opportunities to every. If you live in a poor inner city area, you live five to ten years less than somebody living in a leafy suburb in a very nice house. It's not the fault of the NHS. It's the fault of the underfunding of the NHS that much of this is not dealt with. And so it is about an NHS, a national health service, that isn't faced with constant privatisation of half of its services, 
that isn't faced with constant underfunding and isn't faced with the stress levels of A&E doctors who can barely cope with the numbers coming in because the hospital's priority is paying off the private finance initiative loan rather than investing in the hospital itself. And health is, yes, physical health, but it's also mental health within our society. A quarter of us during our lifetime will suffer some kind of stress, mental health related problem, crisis. Some will get through it, through the love of their partner, their friends, their family, their neighbours, their community, and they'll get through. Others will get help and support, and I hope they do, and they will get through it. Some won't. Some young people will find themselves in a crisis and because of a sort of macho culture they won't want to talk to anybody about it. And some young men will sadly take their own lives, usually young men, because they're frightened of talking about the crisis they're in. They can't say, see a way forward for it. So there's two things we can do. One, of course, is to demand real parity of esteem within the National Health Service and proper funding of our mental health services. But also, in uh, our own attitudes, our own attitudes, don't do denigration of people because they're going through a crisis. Don't make jokes about mental health conditions. Recognize it's something that could affect any of us. We all know people affected by it. And as a community, as a society, reach out and support them in just the same ways we'd reach out and support anybody going through a physical health crisis. It's something we can do. Let's be strong enough to support and strong enough to care. But all this comes down to our attitude in politics, our attitude in society. Are we to become a society where the richest minority at the top get richer and richer? The first aid, first aid needed. Is there a doctor or first aider here? First responder, anybody? On the way. On the way. Thank you very much. Does somebody need some help over here? Are you okay? Thanks, for, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. That shows the community responds very quickly when somebody needs help. Thank you very much. Thank you, responders, for taking care of that person. But it's, a, it's our attitude in society. Are we to become an offshore island of Europe where taxes for the very rich and corporations are low, public expenditure is low, investment in productive and creative industry is low, and we become a sort of service economy off the shores of Europe? Or are we to instead aspire collectively for a society where nobody is left behind, where we don't tolerate the idea that thousands of people would sleep on the streets every night because there isn't a home for them, where so many children are growing up in insecure private rented accommodation with bad quality housing and ill health as a result of it. An approach to our environment that is supportive and protective of it rather than destructive of it. A society that invests in the cultural experience of all of us, invests in music, art and theatre for all of us. We can do things very differently in our society. Therefore, this campaign at one level is about the election of one person to be leader of the party. But I look at it this way. It's a campaign about the kind of country we want to live in and the place we want to play in the world. Do we become a power in the world to promote democracy, justice, peace and human rights around the world and ensure we adhere to all the environmental protocols that are necessary around the world. There is so much we can achieve if we open our minds to the possibilities of what can be done. So we have a program which is, in broad terms, about social justice, is about opportunities for all is about an expanding and developing and sustainable economy. But it's also about how we do our politics. Do we do our politics by allowing an elite to decide what the politics should be, an elite to decide what the policies are, an elite to decide all the decisions we make, or is it to be the participation 
of the hundreds of thousands of people that are now part of our party and our movement. Is it about to be the democracy of everyone and their involvement? So, at the end of this campaign, we're going to be faced with opposing this Tory government and what it does. We're going to be faced with this Tory government and what it's doing to local government, to health and to society as a whole. And it's up to us, because the media will not do it for us, to put forward that alternative, that credible alternative of economic development, that credible alternative of social justice, that credible alternative of saying we want to live and be strong and proud enough to say we want to live in a society where there is no racism, there is no discrimination, and nobody is left behind. So, our strength is what we do together. Our strength is in our own confidence. Many have walked before us, gained us the right to vote, gained women the right to vote, faced down the racists and brought about proper laws to try and protect people. But at the end of the day, it's people coming together that achieve that change. That coming together has inspired so many to aspire for everybody else to achieve this. A society where no one and no community is ever forgotten or left behind. Thank you very much. Why you've come to hear Jeremy Corbyn today? Well, I just want to see if there's room for one honest person actually, well, in Westminster. That's what I want to learn. And I want to hear him talk and hear what he has to say. And, you know, because they keep slagging him off, as they do. And uh, I don't think it's very fair on the guy. So I just want to see if there's actually room for one honest, honest politician. That's what I want to find out. I'll just say you're a supporter at the moment. So. Well, I'm a bit halfway. Yeah, I just want to be won over. So so we'll see if we can. All right. Why are you here this lunchtime? Um, we're, we're studying with the London School of Puppetry this week, um, and we found out that Jeremy was going to be speaking um, today, and it's been a really lovely part of this course because it's about being creative and working together and democracy and care and compassion. Um, and Jeremy's really echoing what, what we're learning about. So um, it was really important to come as a group as well and, and, and be part of this energy and, and support him. Would you say you're a fan of Jeremy? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. His beliefs, his, his, how he lives, his, how he lives his beliefs and not just talks about his beliefs. What about what Labour MPs have said? Many of them don't think that he is a, a capable leader. Well, of course, because, you know, his, his, how he is has often shown them up. Um, and, and I think that it's, a, he's, it's amazing how terrifying that is to people when someone is living with a, and working with authenticity and honesty that it shows people up. Um, yeah, I think that's what we're seeing. BBC. Yeah, no comment. All right, fair enough. I'm here because I'm very interested in what Jeremy Corbyn has to offer as a leader and a potential Prime Minister. I think he has integrity and um, obviously I'm concerned about what's happening in the Labour Party so I've come to hear him for myself but at the root of it I, I believe in what he says and um, so I'm here just to, to listen and uh, you know, make my own decision. Are you a Labour member? I am a Labour member. So you'll be voting in the contest? I will be. Do you feel that he's enthused the Labour Party in a way that maybe hasn't happened for a while? I think the Labour Party, he's enthused the Labour Party members on the ground because of the increase in membership. I think there's a serious problem in the party. That's a worry. Um, I personally a bit, you know, gutted that they decided to split at this really important time and didn't just stand behind him. Whatever internal issues they have, they're going to have to sort it out. But yes, I think that he's brought politics back into an arena that's exciting, it's engaging young people, it's bringing people back into the political arena that means something for the everyday person. That for years, I think we've just been in a middle ground that's not felt that it's anything's ever going to change. So. But what about winning elections? Dame Margaret Beckett, Derby South MP, doesn't think Jeremy can lead the Labour Party to victory in the 2020 election? A lot of MPs don't, but um, I, 
I'm not convinced. I think he has a way of doing things that's different. I think change is challenging. I think the, the politicians and politics need a, a good rumble and a good change from within, and that can that can take time, and it can also it can frighten people because things are different. So I just think it's an exciting time, and I do think if he well, who knows if he gets the leadership which I hope he does, then the party needs to get behind him and make the party strong. Why you've come Jeremy today, what you're what you looking to hear? Uh, for Jeremy Corbyn, basically, um, because he represents sort of real change in, uh, in, in UK politics. I mean, we've, we've had the same old, same old since God knows when. I mean, as a child, I, yeah, I mean, obviously you are a child, but for as long as I've uh, sort of remembered, you can't really tell any politician apart, but now you know, there's a chance for real change. It's great. He this definitely enthuses people. You can see that at events like this. Is he a strong enough leader to win the 2020 general election? I, I, I guess I, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I, I believe so. I mean, I, I wasn't really interested in politics until um, until fairly recently. I mean, look at the amount of people. It's, um, it's absurd for people to suggest that he can't be a good leader. Good to talk to you. Thanks very much.